right, Matt, record buttons press, man. I, I love the smile already and the enthusiasm. I love it. I love it. We've had the Buttery Bros on. We've had Sean Woodland. We've had Bill Grunler. We've had Chase Ingram, Tommy Marquez. How fucking cool is it? Pardon my French. That we have Matt Chan on the Mind Over Matter podcast right now. I almost couldn't pronounce that correct. But Matt, thanks so much for taking the time out of your day today, man, and uh, you know, giving us some awesome value today. Yeah, thanks, Jimmy. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be on, especially with all those guys uh, preceding me. I mean, that's pretty awesome to set the stage. <laughs> well, you're no slouch yourself, sir. <laughs> thanks. So want to want to give a just a basic down and dirty you know, just kind of intro on you, Matt. And here we go. I already told you the dogs are bound to hop in and they want to get some screen time too. But uh, basically right. started your professional career as a firefighter. Uh, then you decided to focus more on training full-time, you know, getting ready for the games, uh, which you did successfully. I think one of your best finishes when 2012, you finished second place on the podium behind the one and only Rich Froning, who's still yep. somehow dominating the, dominating the game right now. Uh, but after that, then you'd, you know, had a tragic incident, which we'll talk about in 2014, almost took your life and you battled back. You somehow PR'd your back squat and did all these crazy things after that. You're just, a, you're just a freaking machine, man, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But, uh, you know, now you're back to the fire department, which is awesome. It's cool to see your transition back into that. I love your post. I love your enthusiasm and your passion that you have for the job. And you can see that in what you do, but you know, Matt, why don't you tell, aside from what I just mentioned, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself that I didn't touch on already for those of you who don't know you as well as I do? Yeah, I mean, that was, that was a lot of the stuff. Um, I grew up on the south side of Chicago. Um, you know, I was a lifelong athlete, swimmer, and that was, I primarily grew up swimming. And, uh, you know, throughout the years, I played different sports, baseball here and there, football here and there. Um, but I... I was always swimming from the age of five until I graduated from high school. I played water polo at Western Illinois University. Um, and that was a pretty cool experience too, uh, because it was a club team. And, you know, most, most water polo teams are club teams. Uh, and I learned a lot during that process because we had to fundraise. We had to fund our own trips. And, you know, most people uh, in college, you know, that's not even something that you learn how to do. So that was a pretty neat experience. And then, uh, I moved to Winter Park, Colorado in 2001 when I graduated, uh, December of 2001. And that's where I met my wife. Uh, we, we, got, we got married in 2006 in, in Winter Park, Colorado, and uh, both fell in love with skiing and all that stuff. And uh, I was introduced to the fire department in, around that same time frame, maybe like 2003, mm -hmm. uh, and I was a volunteer. And that was kind of my introduction to the fire service. I learned a lot from those guys. Um, and it really lit my, my fire for the fire service, getting a career job. Uh, like you said, I, I, during that time, I learned uh, of CrossFit and started doing uh, CrossFit as kind of like a training program. And of course, fell, fell in love with the uh, novelty of the variance side of it. You know, I've got a pretty short attention span. And um, I liked that every day was a little bit different. And I also just saw crazy results that I hadn't seen in years. Mm -hmm. um, Put on 10 pounds, 15 pounds, like immediately, uh, didn't change a diet or anything like that. And I think most of that is because I'd never done back squats, deadlifts and all that. Uh -huh. So my lower, my lower body got significantly heavier. <laughs> um, but you know, and I, I saw the benefit of doing CrossFit right away, uh, at, at, uh, at my job. And that was a really cool experience to correlate, you know, uh, this well-rounded fitness with what I could do on the job and what I'm capable of. Um, and I kind of really fell in love with it. So I opened a CrossFit gym in 2008 mm -hmm. uh, with Sheree and we were just training people out of our garages. And this is back in the day when, you know, you had to explain to people what CrossFit was <laughs> because yeah. they had no idea. Um, and, you know, now it's like a household name. You see it on television shows and all that stuff. But, um, you know, back then we had to, literally cold call people and be like, Hey, you want to come try this program? I'd go over to my neighbor's house and be like, Hey Manny, you want you want to try uh, this, uh, this workout? So, you know, there were some obstacles there, but you know, by 2014, we had over 400 members. Uh, we had a thriving facility in the North area of Denver. Um, and it just became a little bit too much for us. So we actually ended up selling the, the gym in 2014 mm -hmm. and pursuing uh, just the CrossFit HQ stuff. I worked for CrossFit HQ for a number of years as a seminar staff trainer, uh, wrote a seminar called the competitors course, um, 
yeah. And, and during that time as well, I was also very competitive. So that was about, you know, that brings us almost up to date. You know, I'm back at the, the uh, fire department for about four, almost four years now. Awesome. And yeah, so I've got a total of nine years uh, actually at work. Yeah. Um, and I finally feel like I'm coming into a groove with, with the fire service where, you know, I, I don't get bothered by running a bunch of calls. I really love it. Uh, you know, I'm, I, I get put on the medic unit a lot and I really love that because our uh -huh. fire department, you know, we run, uh, we run in basically a, a medic unit and an engine at the same time. Uh, and then they marry up for any sort of fire. So mm -hmm. that's, that's pretty cool. You know, back in the day, it was just the medic unit sitting outside like this, just like, <laughs> okay, go be heroes guys. <laughs> But, throwing uh, yeah, throwing some saline bombs from the front yard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I feel like I've really kind of caught a stride with uh, uh, with the fire service, and you know, I'm I'm now kind of like looking at the long term of like how I how I go about promotion and um, you know acting out of class and stuff like that. So I'm really stoked on it. I think I'm lucky to have found a career that I actually just love doing, and I love being there. And um, you know, I love doing the CrossFit stuff and it was great to change people's lives, but you know, we, we have the unique ability to change people's lives on a daily basis in the worst time of their life. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that's not all the calls, but you know, it is a lot of them. And, uh, I feel that service really fulfills me and that's why I keep going back. I love that, Matt. That's awesome. You know, that's, I, I really feel like in order to be a firefighter and do what we do, you know, sure there's a want, but I feel like a lot of it is a calling too. It takes a pretty special person to want to, you know, put themselves last and put other people first and, you know, just do whatever it takes to get the job done every time. So I love that you're back and I, I could definitely see your passion about your job, even though they're on the med unit. I am too. I know what that's like, but yeah. <laughs> you know, somebody has got to do it. Right. <laughs> it, yep. Yep. And it's all what you make of it because I think, you know, the med unit like gets a, gets a bad rap, but I mean, <laughs> We, we run all the cool calls like and like I said we get married up with the engine company for pretty much any fire attack and you know all that stuff um, yeah. so I, I think it's the best of both worlds um, you get to see some pretty gnarly stuff and get your hands in there get down and dirty so, absolutely yeah. you get to get out of the station too you get to turn some wheels from time to time which that's, is nice <laughs> that's true <laughs> So Matt, kind of segueing off fire, we'll, we'll definitely circle back around that because there's a lot of firefighters, male and female, who are definitely going to be watching this. You just recently took first place at the Titan Games, and yeah. that was on the MVCs, the Titan Games with The Rock. First off, I want to ask you, what's it like, you know, working kind of hand in hand with The Rock? What's that guy like? Oh, I wish I could say I was actually working hand in hand with The Rock. But, uh... <laughs> We would see him for maybe like, uh, maybe at the most 10 minutes at a time. Oh, um, so, okay. So, so it was very limited exposure. Um, but every experience that we had with him was just, you know, I, I could, I could see the rock being a guy that, you know, is so overwhelmed by how much he has to do and how many people are pulling him in multiple directions that he could be a total jerk, but that is not the case at all. He took time to, ask us questions about ourselves, learn a little bit about us. Um, believe it or not, this was insane. Uh, but he, I got a phone call from him about three weeks ago, right before the final episode aired. Um, and of course, I, I, I didn't recognize the number. So I sent him a <laughs> voicemail. <laughs> so, uh, so I, you know, he left a message just, you know, being super gracious and saying, thank you for being a part of this. It wouldn't have been what it was without you guys. Um, you know, I could tell that you guys were not only having fun, but being competitive. Uh, so, you know, from the bottom of my heart, thank you. And it was just like, that is not something he needed to do. No. Uh, but, but it just speaks to his character of gratitude. And that's, there's a reason why he is as big and as popular as he is right now. It's because he's the man and he doesn't let people, you know, fall, get, get cast in his shadow. He, he definitely props people up. Yeah, Absolutely. So I got to ask you, you know, a lot of what we see in the movies, a lot of what we see on TV is, you know, scripted. So I have to ask you, I know you're a humble guy. You're super fit. In 2012, you finished second place behind Rich Froning on the podium, who's arguably the, still the fittest man on earth. Well, that's debatable with Frazier. Well, that's kind of a touchy subject, right? But yeah. for a super fit guy like yourself, were you putting on a facade or an act out there? Was it just super easy and you're trying to make it look hard or were, were the challenges actually difficult for you? Oh, no, no, no. The, the, if there was anything that was 100% real, unscripted, was what it was, it was the challenges from start to finish. Um, you know, there was moments where they had cut out 
uh, some of the duration of some of those events. But for the most part, you know, when, when, when you see the guys, you know, the two, two competitors standing on a line or standing on a dot, and you see that screen go three, two, one, <laughs> and, and then they shoot the fireworks, you know, that, that was the start of our event. So uh, it was strange because sometimes when, even when they would start it, it's, you know, you could hear, you could see that the rock was talking and you could see Kerry champion and golden boy talking to him, but you had no idea what they were saying because their microphones weren't hot. So like, <laughs> so they're just up there talking and you're standing on there on the line. Like, okay, are we going? Are we, doing this? Are we going? <laughs> and then all of a sudden they would just say, uh, the, the guy that was kind of like the MC would be like, okay, this is live gameplay. Here we go. And, and so it's just like, <laughs> like, holy fuck, this is happening right now. <laughs> so I, I'd have to say that every one of the events, uh, no one held back. No one was, you know, it wasn't acting. It was legitimate competition. Mm -hmm. So when you see, when you saw like, you know, me lose to uh, Joe Thomas, that mm -hmm. was the real deal. I was just flailing everywhere and he <laughs> took, he took advantage of it. And, uh, they, they did, uh, so uh, they did shorten some of the uh, things. That's the only thing that was kind of Hollywood. Gotcha. Did they talk about doing like a champions event or anything later on with it? Are they going to keep in touch with you? Yeah. So uh, in the contract, there is a, there is a, a clause that says, you know, um, uh, I don't remember exactly how it was written, but it, it mentioned like, you know, we may ask you in the following years to come back for a special uh special guest or special event or whatever. So, I mean, I would be excited if that happened because, <laughs> you know, I thought what, what really would have been cool is have like the Titan, uh, the Titan champion of the season two Titan games where like, then I go head to head with Danny. Ooh, because, I like yeah, that. I mean, who, the, who knows? I mean, I, I, there's a good chance I would definitely lose that. So. <laughs> well, that's awesome, Matt. Well, let's, uh, let's circle back around. Let's talk about CrossFit real quick. Now, obviously you know, the Chan name is a, is a household name in the CrossFit community. It still is. Do you have any regrets being a CrossFit athlete or any type of uh, competition re related regrets in your career? Uh, maybe just that um, I took it a little uh, too, too long. I knew the last couple of years that I was competing, I was just trying to prove to myself that I could. Um, and I didn't really have the winner's mindset. Uh, whereas in 2012, you know, I was not only shooting for the podium, but I, I was confident that I could win the CrossFit games. Mm -hmm. And there was a very big shift after achieving that. I, you know, I felt fulfillment. I felt like I had set out on a goal and achieved that goal of standing on the podium. Um, so when, when, you know, 2013 rolled around, I'm not going to lie. Um, we were, you know, driving around in an Airstream and having fun and, taking competition a little less seriously, even though I still won that region, I still, you know, went to the CrossFit games. I think I took like 16th place. I, I did not train uh, for the CrossFit games. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I, I think during that time, I, I kind of lost a little bit of the passion for, for that and really started to dive back into some of the other sports that I had been missing out on, like climbing, mountain biking, stuff like that. Um, but I went back in 2015 after I hurt myself and, mm -hmm. uh, kind of worked back through that whole process. And I used that, uh, I, I used that year as a, as a opportunity to train my body back into shape, uh, after that injury that I had. And 2015, I, you know, I worked super hard and it brought me into ninth in my region when they were only sending five to the games. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was proud of what I did. And, um, you know, the, the road back was difficult. It was bumpy, but it gave me a focus that I could continue to work hard and rehab myself and address strengths and weaknesses and stuff like that. And, you know, I was super happy with ninth place. It, it wasn't the overall goal. The, the goal was top five, but um, you know, the level of competition when I went back in 2015 at the regional level was much, much higher. So, you know, I saw, uh, there was a kid named, I think his name was, uh, uh, fuck, I forget. He was from, uh, he was from Arizona. Um, I want to say it was like Johnny, uh, Vegas or something like uh, Johnny Vegas or something. Uh, like that. But anyway, Vargas or Medina. Okay. He was a younger guy. He was, uh, literally, I think he was 19 years old. And, you know, I was standing up there and I was uh, 38 at the time. And I was like, 
oh my God, I am double your age. This is ridiculous. <laughs> what am I doing here? <laughs> And, uh, and he took, he took, uh, either eighth or 10th, but we were right next to each other. And it was like, oh man, I, I, maybe I should, uh, I should hang it up. This is, right. this is probably good. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you talked about your injury. Um, there's an awesome article that was written on CrossFit's website still up cause I double checked it this morning just to make sure. Uh, but 2014, you went on a little bit of a bike ride. Why don't you pick it up from there? Kind of what happened? Um, 2014, it was, uh, I, I had just gotten over, uh, some bulging discs in my back and uh, finally was starting to feel good. So I started doing a little bit more riding and uh, started lifting weights again and stuff like that. And Shree and I just took a nice leisurely ride out in the West Magnolia trail system in Boulder. And uh, you know, halfway through it just, we, we were, because it was the 4th of July, we were kind of stick together and um, you know, just basically be, let it be leisurely. And I kind of stopped in one, this one spot or slowed down and started, waiting for her as I was just kind of toting around I popped over a, a log that was in the road or in the trail and uh I I just fell I caught the caught the chain rings on the on the log I went forward as I fell the handlebar handlebars hit me on the inside of my leg and it's like when you scrape your shin on a box uh you know you don't make it all the way onto the box and then you just grind down it um it was that sort of pain where it's like oh god oh god oh god oh god oh god and then you kind of shake it off. Well, that shake it off didn't really happen. It just, I tried to shake it off. And where normally you could start to walk normal and be like, okay, I feel better. It actually started to swell. And mm -hmm. I looked, you know, I, I felt down in the in my shorts and I could feel it swelling in my leg. So I, uh, I, cu I pulled my pants off, uh, pulled my leg out of the, out of the bike shorts and, you know, it was like, oh crap, I'm in big trouble. And, mm -hmm. you know, just being a first responder, just seeing that much swelling that fast, I knew it was probably a large vessel that I had severed, ruptured, whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, when Sheree rolled around, it just, I just said to her, I was like, oh man, I was like, don't, don't, don't get too upset, but we have to call 911. I'm, I, I messed up my leg and we just have to call 911. Um, I don't think putting pressure on it's a good idea. It's just, it's blowing up. So, mm -hmm. We couldn't get a call out, um, so Sheree kind of ran around frantically trying to find somebody in the area or get service and was able to do so. She came back, and uh, at that time, the thing was just a blob in my in my leg. It looked like I had a butt cheek on the front <laughs> of my body. I saw that picture. It was massive. Yeah. So that was kind of the – that was the scary part. You know, we got I got transported out of there uh, by a helicopter. Um and flown to a level one trauma center here in the Denver area and they took care of me. And it was pretty scary because as I was getting into the, uh, as, as we were rolling into the emergency room and they were doing the transfer from the flight to the, to the nursing staff uh, and hospital staff, you know, I, it must've been a level one trauma activation because, mm -hmm. you know, it, everybody was there. <laughs> yeah. And I was, you know, I was the guy that's getting transferred, you know, so uh -huh. I'm, I'm laying there and uh, the doc kind of looks over and he, over at me and he's like, we're going to do everything we can to save your leg. And it was just like, uh, what, sorry, what'd you say? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, you know, I didn't expect to hear that, but you know, um, the flight nurses basically, uh, and I was high on fentanyl, you know, they, they yeah. dosed me. So, uh -huh. um, but apparently uh, I hadn't had uh, a pulse in my right foot for some period of time. Oh. Yeah, so um, they they were pretty concerned right away that I was gonna that I was gonna lose my leg. Uh, so they opened up and did three fasciotomies, which is that kind of picture that a lot of people have seen, uh -huh. uh, where they filleted my quad from <laughs> basically the the hip all the way to the knee, and then the two lower parts of my leg, and uh, that saved my leg. So you know, as far as rehab, uh, they tied off the they tied off that vessel that that. Uh, ruptured that got crushed uh, they had to go kind of up into my pelvis area and and find it and then tie it off oh wow and, yeah crazy and uh, they closed uh, they did not close all those wounds up the the uh, the fasciotomies those those were left open for a couple days they applied a, a wound vac which basically you know is a vacuum for uh, inflammation um, so they just suck all that out into this tub and I sat there for like that for like three days in the hospital. And then they put, uh, they talked about putting uh, a skin graft on. And mm. I was, I, you know, at the time I, I, 
I hadn't known anybody with a skin graft and they said, uh, they said, well, you should, you should, uh, you know, uh, research the process. Obviously you're not going anywhere. Research the process, look at some pictures, make sure that's what, you know, you're okay with it. And I don't know if you've ever Googled skin graft, but there are some gnarly, mm-hmm. gnarly skin grafts. <laughs> so I asked them if there, I asked him if there was another option and, uh, and they gave me the option to try and stitch it back together. And that's what we ended up doing. Gotcha. Well, damn dude, that's, that's crazy. Cause you and I see that type of stuff all the time at work, but a lot of people don't get to see that firsthand. That's a, that's a pretty serious injury. You know, we talk about your femur and, you know, being just about an inch away from totally rupturing the artery. That's a, that's potentially fatal. That's a, yeah. Your, your femur holds the most blood in your entire body. So that's a, that's a, cra- that's a crazy just type of circumstance that you went through. Were you, were you scared of losing your life? Oh, no. No, honestly, like, it was one of those things where, I mean, I, I, was, I was laying there in the trail, and it's like, all right, this is just an awkward situation. It's, I'll be fine. And I think the, the moment that it became like, okay, this is real, is when I saw that doctor, and the doctor – uh, said that I might lose my leg. That was where it was like, okay, this isn't what this is. I, I should take this seriously. This is not as small of a deal as I, I initially thought. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they, you know, afterwards, like after talking to the docs and talking to Sheree and, you know, getting the rundown from the docs and nurses, they were like, yeah, if you would have had even just a pinhole in your, uh, in your, in the inside of your leg there, you, you most likely would have died. You probably would have uh, bled yeah, out yeah. very quickly. So yeah, that's lucked freaking, out. Yeah, no kidding. That's crazy. Holy shit. But I want to ask you one, one more CrossFit related question, Matt. Then I want to talk, you know, more, more particular about the fire service, your transition, just some importances of the job and just kind of what you learned over the years. But with all the, you know, you know, with all the changes recently, we've seen the world, obviously the pandemic, obviously I'm sure you've, you know, seen Greg Glassman's statements probably weren't the smartest and just all the recent changes in the past couple of years, the regionals being gone to CrossFit and having to qualify through sanctionals. What do you think, or what's kind of your perception of everything right now? Do you think CrossFit's headed in the right direction or, you know, kind of what's, what's your general thoughts? Well, I look at CrossFit from a different lens now. <clears throat> you know, I use CrossFit among other methods to, to train myself. Um, and, you know, I write a program that other people follow and that's, I, I look at CrossFit as a longevity program for myself now. So like, you know, what they're doing in the games and stuff like that. Uh, I haven't been super concerned about any of that stuff. Um, and, you know, once I kind of, uh, resigned from the, uh, HQ staff, I kind of put that aside as well. Mm-hmm. So I look at, I look at CrossFit from the lens of like fitness, health, longevity, that stuff. And I think CrossFit is going to continue doing everything that they've been doing um, that's, you know, changing people's lives in a positive way. So I don't, I don't think that that can ever change, especially when you have a staff that like CrossFit does that are so passionate about what they do. And again, contributing to changing people's lives on a daily basis. They're so good at what they do Mm -hmm. um, that I think, I think CrossFit's going to remain pretty much unchanged. Now, as it applies to the CrossFit games and maybe media and all that stuff, you know, I don't know a ton about the CrossFit Games as far as the back end of it, but I do know that for a bunch of years, they were in the red. And yeah. that's why you saw the changes uh, to that is that, you know, they put C- CEOs or people running in it, uh, CrossFit Incorporated, as a, uh, they put people in there. They were like, you know, you can't keep doing this. You guys are just mm-hmm. draining, draining the funds. So I think that's why you saw the changes to the regionals where they, you know, um, so went to the sanctional model. Mm-hmm. Is that going to change? Probably. I don't know. Um, you know, they, they excluded, uh, the masters this year, which was you know, before that. they, before they canceled the games and you can't blame them for that stuff because I don't know how much, uh, revenue that actually brings in. They spend a lot of money to broadcast that on YouTube and, you know, if you watch the numbers at the bottom, uh, you know, how many live viewers, it doesn't even hold a candle to the main event. Absolutely. So I do think you'll probably see changes, um, you know, but again, that's just from an outsider's perspective at this point. Um, but I think Eric Rosa is a smart man mm-hmm. and that he will probably run that company uh, better than Greg ever could have. So 
Yeah, yeah no, I, very well said. He's already making a lot of, uh, you know, changes and there seems to be a lot of initiative on his end to, you know, trying to kind of turn it in the right direction because it was spiraling downhill pretty fast, but it seems to be some type of recovery, which is nice. Yeah, you know, I think he's probably, I mean, he's got a very uh, uh, unique background Absolutely. You know, with in the technology field. So, you know, I think I hope that there's something that they can do, especially considering our current uh, state of affairs with the pandemic, something that they can do to broadcast, you know, uh, you know, training online and stuff like that. So I think that would be a huge thing for CrossFit.com is to, you know, actually host live training sessions for the everyday person. Yeah. Uh, that, that would be pretty cool. But, you know, again, um, he's a smart, technologically savvy guy. And I think you're probably going to see that play into CrossFit somehow. Absolutely. Well, that kind of segues me to my next question, more related to the fire service. Now you're a firefighter. I'm a firefighter. We both do cross it or some variation or form of, you know, functional fitness. Us doing that and having that background and experience for a decent amount of time, we understand that it's important to be a well-rounded athlete and individual just because of all the dynamics that are thrown at us with our job, our flip mobility or flexibility or strength or endurance or stamina, so on and so forth. It all, it's all important. So do you think that functional fitness or CrossFit per se is the best training regimen for firefighters or first responders? Uh, with a caveat, yes. Um, I think that CrossFit is very similar to our job where it's a constantly varied, uh, unknown, unknowable task. And that's, that's the biggest benefit for, to our job. But where I think, you know, I put the caveat and the, uh, an asterisk is I don't think high intensity all the time is necessary or even appropriate for firefighters. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is because not only is there the thing where people who are unindoctrinated to, uh, to intensity should probably not be using intensity <laughs> at work, right? That's, you see, you see it happen, right? Somebody mm -hmm. wants to join in for a workout and then afterwards they're like, what the fuck happened? I don't feel good. <laughs> you turn the corner and they got their feet up on one of the Barca loungers. You know? uh -huh. But, but uh, I, I think really one of what I've seen is that a lot of firefighters that train using the CrossFit method do high intensity, uh, training, which is great. You know, it pushes up your VO2 max, it builds muscle tissue, it burns body fat, and all of that stuff is great. But at the same time, if you over prioritize anaerobic training, you lose ground on your aerobic training. And mm -hmm. we are at the, we're at the limit of our air bottle, as far as work is concerned. And we have to be efficient with oxygen. And if you're past the po point of your anaerobic threshold, you're just going to suck that bottle down faster if you don't have an aerobic base. So I think for me, the biggest change I would make to a firefighter's program is at least three days a week of aerobic specific training. That can be multimodality where you see different movements, but specifically keeping the heart rate low while you're working. Mm -hmm. oh, absolutely. Have you ever thought about doing a training program specifically for firefighters? Well, I, so I write a program. Uh, we have a, I have a company called Train for the Win. I have mm -hmm. a partner. Uh, we originally did, started this, you know, when we were into CrossFit competitions. And that's the route we kind of took. And since then, and since I've been back in the fire service, I wanted a program for myself that mm -hmm. I could write and, and do in an hour so that it's not like, you know, staying at the gym all day long uh -huh. uh, on off days. And I didn't want to always be cut short at the fire station. So yeah. uh, I write a program that called Thrive uh, that is 45 to 60 minutes. It is exactly the program that I do because of what we just talked about. Yep. I think there's, a, there's more longevity in low intensity and moderate intensity, you know, three to four days a week, and then hit those high intensity workouts one to two days a week. And somebody my age, which again, I'm, I'm writing the program for myself, mm -hmm. can recover and not feel beat up all the time. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and also like train to be a better firefighter. So I think the answer, long answer to your question is yeah. And I write that program and it's called Train for the Wind Thrive. Awesome. Yeah, because I mean, too, like if you can't go balls to the wall 
every single shift that you're there because if you do pop that structure fire and you're gassed and you're winded, it's it's not as easy to recover. You understand? It's it's not just like a you know you do a wad at the gym and then you know 20 minutes later you're ready to go. It's it, the ball game changes when you're in full gear. Would you think that's pretty accurate? Oh my gosh, yeah. Especially you know it's so hot right now too. Mm-hmm. You know that's a whole other part of this that if you're if your internal temperature is already elevated due to exercise, um, which it's going to be, <clears throat> um, you're already starting a little bit behind the eight ball when you throw your bunker gear on and you're sitting in the, in the apparatus driving to the call and you're just heating up and heating up and heating up and heating up. And I mean, you know, that definitely affects your performance. So mm-hmm. yeah, I, I like to save uh, strength days, for, you know, for one of my two days on. Um, because like you said, it's, it's not something that you need much recovery from. You can mm-hmm. pretty much re-rack a bar and, and just walk out the door. Yeah. Um, and then I like saving one low intensity workout, uh, for the fire, uh, for the fire station, because it, just like you said, um, it, it, it will look like a CrossFit workout where it's like, you know, run on a treadmill for, you know, quarter mile, uh, 21 light kettlebell swings, uh, maybe 12 strict pull-ups, but we'll just do an AMRAP of 20 minutes where the pace is slow and where I'm trying to keep my wits about me and be able to breathe and never go anywhere near failure. I might use a super light kettlebell so that I can, you know, feel like I can breathe and carry on a conversation while I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, But that's that kind of aerobic targeted workout that's uh, using other movements other than just rowing and running. Yeah. That, I think a lot of people aren't used to that Mm -hmm. and it's, it's something we do all the time and I really love it. Yeah, absolutely. So what do you, what do you think is like the hack or the hint to be able to, you know, get everybody on the same page because you got guys at the station who just like to prop their feet up on the recliner, don't like to work out. It's just not like what they like to do. Then you have your go-getters, people like yourself who like to train, stay active, do functional fitness to be ready for whatever call that we could potentially get. How do you find a mesh point? How do you make sure everybody's on the same page? Yeah, that's the question, right? Um, Honestly, I think it comes down to leadership. Uh, and if the leadership promotes a culture of health and, and you know, a healthy lifestyle and longevity, then from the top down, it'll be made a priority. And I know the guy I work for right now, he does a great job of, you know, we're, we're in kind of weird times where we can only have two people in the uh, <laughs> gym at a time, yeah. you know, uh, uh-huh. but he, he, he's like, you know, you two are going to go at this time. We're going to go at this time. Um, and, you know, you, when you make it a group atmosphere and there's an expectation that, hey, we're all going to do some sort of PT today, um, it makes it a lot easier. And I love the team workouts. We did a, we did a great one that was uh, five rounds, 20 cal row. And as, you're, as, as partner one is rowing, partner two picks up a 95-pound barbell in the bench press and performs max reps. But the, Ooh, the, the, tr- okay. the trick was you, you can't re-rack it. <laughs> until the 20 cal <laughs> yeah so you gotta oh, be kind of smart about that yeah yeah but yeah but that made it fun and i think that's what people who don't like exercise they need that little novelty of fun they need uh, to feel like they can be successful so maybe if 95 pounds doesn't make sense for that person even though it does for person one maybe you dumb it down to person two's level for that workout just to make it feel inclusive yeah i love that so <sighs> You know what, I, I guess the, the the next best question I have for you is, you know, what is something through your fire service career have you learned where you failed and you've made a mistake that you'd like to be able to share with other people? What have you learned from that mistake? Does one oh, thing come to okay. your mind? I know there's probably a lot. We've, so we, 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 we all make mistakes, myself included, but if, is there one that stands out in particular that you're just like, oh shit, man, I probably need to fix that? Yeah. Um, Oh, like I said, there's so many, I like just thinking about that. It's just like, I can improve on so many things, but um, you know, back before I took my leave of absence in 2012, I had just a terrible, terrible mindset and I was always on the medic unit and you know, a lot of the calls we, we would get, you know, a, a, a fair percentage of them were, you know, what we would deem BS calls where it's mm. just, this is not an emergency. Why, why are you calling 911 for this? Whatever that was. And I let that stuff get under my skin and it soured me to the point where I was, I was the cancerous guy in the group. You know, I was the guy that, you know, everybody was kind of like, man, shut the fuck up. Don't you like this job? (laughs) 
and frankly, what I think you can learn, what people can learn from that is I was so overextended before I would even come into work that I was fatigued. I was tired. I had things to do. I had stress. I owned a gym. I was training for the CrossFit Games. I was on HQ seminar staff part-time and I was working at the fire station. I was taking trades so that I could go work uh, for CrossFit and then have to pay those trades back, you know, on my days off. Mm -hmm. And I think if there's one thing I could learn, uh, you know, pass on from what I learned then was our job's great and it's hard and you mm -hmm. don't get a lot of sleep. And just remember if that's your main gig, let that be your main gig and focus on it and be the best you can be. Uh, and always keep in mind, I'm here to serve, have a service mindset and a customer service mindset and your, your fulfillment in your job will be so much greater than if you spread yourself thin. So yeah. that's, that's the biggest thing I, I think I've learned. I love that. I love how you said, I can't just, I can't pinpoint one mistake because, <laughs> because it seems to be one, like a snowball effect. One thing after another, every single shift, something goes wrong, something breaks. I fucked up here. I fucked up there. At least for me, I'm still a young guy. You're not, but <laughs> I wanted to ask you, you know, you had a chance to sit down with the Fit to Fight Fire guys. I actually had them on my podcast as well. It was about a couple months ago. We had an awesome episode. What did you guys talk about on your episode primarily? Oh, man, it's been a while. Uh, I think that was back in 2017. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they had a lot of questions about the CrossFit stuff because I was coming back from uh, working for CrossFit and, and, you know, finishing up my CrossFit Games career and all that stuff. Um, I think they had questions on how to apply – CrossFit in the uh, firehouse, stuff like that. Uh -huh. um, but those guys, those guys are literally, they are experts uh, at what they do. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, John Sparrow and Tom Johnson, those guys have been doing this stuff now for, I, I would think like 10 years. I think it's pretty close to that. Maybe even more. I don't know. Um, but I'm going to be on uh, their podcast later on in September. Pretty excited about it. To, yeah. To come back, talk about the Titan games. Um but I think the things that they do that are unique to the fire services, they will do high intensity training, uh, using gear, not using gear, um, mm -hmm. performing functional tasks that fires, uh, firefighters uh, do on a regular basis, but then also task themselves with situational awareness stuff. And that's something that, you know, I've always overlooked, but having to give a size up, um, oh, yeah. you know, listen, listening to radio communication while you're working out and being able to repeat back uh, what you've heard. Um, you know, remembering a series of numbers and then during the middle of an exercise actually have to repeat those numbers. I mean, Ooh, stuff I like, like that. that. They're, they're, uh, they're fire, firefighter fitness smart. Those guys, you know, um, I don't know what their, their background, their educational background is, mm -hmm. but as far as just being smart dudes for the job, they both have it. Yeah, Absolutely. Are you going to be attending any trainings anytime this year? Could people expect to see you pop up at anything big this year? I mean, I know that everything's uh, weird with COVID, but anything, uh, on, anything on the docket? Yeah, so uh, I, I was registered for the mile high training, um, Ooh, okay. which they do, they do it here. It's kind of like a uh, smaller scale uh, firemanship style uh, conference. Uh -huh. um, I did go to the firemanship last year, so I, I hope if they have it again, I, I will definitely try to make it again this year because it was – fantastic and it just fired me back up for you know being a member of the fire service um and then uh, a couple small ones uh but i've also been invited to do i think it's the uh i forget what it's called but it's i'm going down to sterile florida potentially if they open everything back mm -hmm. up uh for nozzle forward that's what it's called ah yeah okay yeah. they, they offer that class here that in before. texas as well it's a good class cool, cool. You'll have a lot of fun. Anything else or just those two for now? Uh, I mean, I'm registered for a, a fire instructor course, you know, Ooh, that we have okay. to do for our state cert. But yeah, just working on the stuff towards uh, becoming a better firefighter, but also kind of with the route of becoming a lieutenant in the future, you know, maybe two years down the line. Awesome. Y'all have a pretty extensive testing process for that? Yeah. Um, there's obviously a written test. Mm -hmm. Uh, you have to have all your state certs, uh, you have to have time in the seat. Um, and then you, you know, you, you do a, a written test, a practical test, and then an in interview. I think they're weighted equally, uh, which I, you know, guys are always fired up about that. It should, it should all be about the practical. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, 
but yeah, then, and then we do a, a rule of threes. Do you guys do that? Do, what's the rule of threes? Our, our rule of threes is like, um, if there's one position open, they interview three guys, uh, the top three. And then, and then they take from that, that group of three and, and that keeps cycling down for every position, uh, that they hire, that they have a, a, a potential hire for. We don't have it like that per se. We, we actually just opened a DO spot, a dedicated DO spot because we only had, uh, you know, basically you, if you want to call them backup drivers, then that, that's essentially what they were. There was no specific title, but now there is. So they just got through a huge testing process for that. It's just kind of as an as need basis, but I think they're trying to get it to where it's an annual test where you can take. And that list is good for a year, kind of like the hiring process, which is a little bit different for everywhere, but we're getting there. It's a little bit different. Yeah. Oh, and it is everywhere. Um, you hear some of these uh, departments who have, you know, you're just, you've been here for a little while, so you're automatically promoted. You're the, you're the <laughs> next guy sitting in the front seat. But, but you know, um, then you hear the ones, you know, there's a department nearby that they have such a lengthy process. Uh, one of my friends is going through it right now that it's like, oh my God, that's so right. stressful. Like, uh -huh. there's like five enormous steps to, to actually get the job. And it's just like, you know, they, they, he's been studying for a year now. Um, and it's not like every other day or, you know, spend 30 minutes, he's kicking his ass every day of the week studying this stuff. And, mm. uh, you know, he's like, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to get this job. <laughs> it's like, Man, that's crazy. It's, it's pretty competitive. I mean, it's, it's interesting to, you know, obviously hear how y'all does department do, but everybody's different. But I think one commonality across the board people don't really understand how hard this job is to get. There's such a lengthy hiring process. It's not just like a McDonald's and say, Hey, I want this and that. Give me that now. Or I, I want to apply to that station. This one. No, it's a, it's lengthy. It's hard. It's the best job in the world, but that's that way for a reason. We get so hard to get. Yeah, that's true. And you know, what's crazy about that is I, I am still shocked how many people come into Academy out of shape and unprepared. You know, they, they interview very well and they have all the necessary items on their tick list of, of uh, uh, certifications and, and, and all that stuff, accreditations and, and you know, what have you. Mm -hmm. And then they show, they show up and it's just like, uh, what, what, what have you been doing since you got this job offer? You know? <laughs> um, and, and that's, you know, I, I really do think that that's changing as well, that, you know, the focus on fitness and health is becoming part of the process as well, which is really cool because it, as a, as a, as a member of, uh, of our, uh, fire department, I want to know that everybody's capable of the same workload that I am and that one person's not going to be overburdened, uh, by a task, you know, and, and that makes everybody safer. At the end of the day too, you got to trust who's behind you, right? Cause if you go down, you want somebody to be able to pull you out. I mean, it's, it's that simple. Without a doubt. I mean, I hope that day never comes, but yes, you're absolutely right. Yeah. So I want to ask you, Matt, last fire related question, and then we'll segue to a little bit different topic. What do you think defines a good firefighter or what do you think firefighters in general can work on to be the best guy or best, best girl on their company to be an asset to the team? I think the number one trait uh, of a good firefighter is just passion for the, for service. Um, because if you have passion for service, then training is going to come naturally. Uh, and, training is probably second on the list is that not only physical fitness, not only uh, strategy and tactics, um, but also just, you know, the, the technique of the job of firefighting. And there's a big, there's a big, uh, there's a big, uh, you know, part of our job that if you've never done something, you're going to look silly or fail at it. And it's true of like, you know, when we started doing CrossFit, right? It's, mm -hmm. I'd never done a squat snatch before. So I was missing it backwards. I was missing it forwards. Like I would catch it high and then squat down with it. But, but it just takes reps. And every task that we know that we're going to perform on a regular basis that we learned in Academy, that, you know, in Academy, they teach you the, the, the JPR way of doing everything. Mm -hmm. And and at some point, that JPR style of doing it is not as efficient as what the the, the more senior guys might have figured out. Absolutely. And that's the exi that's like a strict pull-up versus a kipping pull-up. <laughs> you got to do 100 of them. We're going to figure out a way that you can do them better, faster, and not feel so messed up. So I love that. The, and the, the same is true for throwing a ladder. The same is true for pulling a hose line. The same is true for working pinch points. Like, 
What position do you put your body in? How quickly do you move? How slowly do you move? Uh, how do you help the guy that's on the knob not feel any resistance as he's advancing a hose line? And all of that stuff is, it needs to be practiced like any other technique needs to. So my, my super long answer to your question was basically, if you have passion, you're gonna train. Mm -hmm. Okay, because training is a big part of that. So and it doesn't need to be crazy. 30 minutes every other day or every day or, every, or you know, once a set, whatever. You're going to become a better firefighter if you just put in that little little bit of time. Yeah, no, I love that, dude. Well said. It's a, you know, it's a crawl, walk, run progression. You got to start somewhere, right? And you just add on gradually and gradually until it, where it becomes, you know, second nature. Because especially when yeah. it's banged down in smoke, you can't see anything, the game changes. But if you practice, practice makes perfect. I love that. That's yeah, awesome. and it's okay to suck too, right? It's just like no, they're all failure. Swat snatch. Yeah. Beginners are going to look like beginners mm -hmm. and there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, and the way you, the way you uh, circumnavigate that is you be humble. I, I have heard you say that on other podcasts. Like if you're humble, you're, you're going to, you're going to learn more. You're going to have less of an ego and you're going to be, you're going to surpass everybody that has the ego that doesn't want to look stupid. Exactly. But I think that's a big thing too. It's, you know, there, there's so much pride working at the fire department. A lot of guys have pride and a lot of guys are afraid to put their pride on the line and look bad in front of their brothers or sisters. Well, in reality, it's, there's nothing to be ashamed about. We're all on the same team. Not we're, not, we're, we're not individuals playing a different sport. So uh, I love that you said that, Matt. So segue into what I said, you know, this podcast is called Mind Over Matter. It's all about mindset. I wanted to ask you, you know, what does mindset mean to you? Because there's a mindset of a firefighter and there's a mindset of somebody who's not a firefighter, but mindset in general is super, super important for what we do. It's just important for life in general. So what does it mean to you in your life? Um, for me, you know, I, I, ha I struggle with things just like everybody else does. Um, and, you know, the biggest thing that, I struggle with is ego and, you know, being a competitive athlete for a number of years, I was very focused on myself. Um, my wife contributed basically everything to making it work for me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, over time I let my ego get a little bit out of control and I became, uh, uh very self-centered. And that's something that I still struggle with because I fall into old, old habits. So, you know, and stuff like the Titan games, it, it, <laughs> even though it's, it was a great experience and stuff like that. At the same time, I feel like that set me up for maybe a couple steps back, you know, tripping up on that stuff. Yeah. So things I, you know, I have to remind myself is like, it's okay to not have an opinion about things uh, to just, you know, bite my lip about things and listen to other people and, and just hear their side of things, whatever that is, you know, a way of doing something or an opinion on a political thing, even though it might rub you the wrong way. Um, it's better sometimes just not have an opinion and just listen. Um, and then the other part of that is, is like, you know, a positive mind state is very difficult to, to, to achieve, but mm. also then to stay, stay there on a regular basis. So, you know, a long time ago, I read the, the seven habits of highly effective people by Stephen Covey. Mm. And a lot of those things are really great. And one of the biggest ones that I think, um, we as firefighters and myself especially uh, can can apply on a daily basis is seek first to understand and then to be understood and you know we make prejudgments on our patients and you know if there's a homeless guy and he's laying at the bus stop and we're just doing a wake up and you know move, move on sort of thing it's, e it's very easy to just right away build a build a narrative that goes along with that person's situation that makes Sorry. it easier for us to understand. But if you simply just ask questions before forming that, sometimes you'll be surprised at the answer. And that applies to, you know, our relationships with our, you know, wives or spouses or girlfriends or whatever. Uh, and it also applies to our, our patients and each other uh, at the fire mm -hmm. station. You know, the people that maybe walk in with, a, with the stink guy that are really worked up about something, you notice it. I notice it. The other people all notice it. Mm -hmm. And we're just like, Hey, Hey asshole, what's your problem? <laughs> um, but, but in reality, maybe that guy had something happen on four day mm -hmm. that he hasn't been able to shake yet. And it's, it's something that he's looking to talk about. And, you know, I think getting older, um, we're more open to those, those kind of conversations. Um, but I know when I was younger, when I was in my 
twenties and thirties, early thirties, you know, if somebody came in with a stink eye, I was just like, man, what a fucking asshole. This guy's always a dick. He's always a dick. But you know, turn, turn the mirror on yourself. I'm sure I've walked in like that. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And, and people haven't treated me like crap. So, you know, I think, I think those are, those are the big things for like mindset, you know, and, and then probably the last thing with mindset that's helped me in the past is being goal oriented. I like to work towards something. Um, whether it's like a bike race six months from now, um, or, you know, if it's like a diet thing, I, I like setting those start and end date goals. Mm -hmm. And then, and then it just keeps me driven towards that thing. And there'll be ups and downs, but at the same time, it's like, okay, I'm still working towards that goal, still working towards that goal. Absolutely. It's just like CrossFit competition. You know, you, you have a competition you're training for. It gives you something to just hold yourself accountable. I feel like accountability is the biggest part of that when setting your goals. Obviously, a degree of realism, which you have just being a high-level athlete, but, you know, something that you can attain long-term, but to where you can maintain for the short-term as well. So that way you don't burn out. Keeps it fun yeah. as well. Yep. So, Matt, on a closing note, man, uh, you know, I know you're a busy guy. got a lot going on. We've talked a lot of great things today. So, again, I'm just so appreciative of your time. This is so cool to be able to connect with, with you and just to, you know, have all these, you know, just incredible people on this show, which I never thought would really come to fruition. But I, for all my guests that I've had on, I've given them ample and sufficient time, especially at the end, just to, you know, speak what's on their mind, speak what's on their heart. So, What's on your mind? What's on your heart? Is there anything that you want to say to anybody or just in general in particular? Um, you know, I think, I, I think some of the stuff we touched on where uh, mindset stuff, um, you know, that's something I have to work on on a regular basis. And it's okay to look at yourself and not be happy with certain traits um, or even things that you've done in the past. As long as you have a forward progress goal, um, you know, there's, there's things that slip into my personality uh, that, that I'm not, it's not a, that I'm ashamed of them, but I do get embarrassed by. And I think that's okay. It's not self-hatred. It's just a better understanding of self and self-awareness. And, you know, it's okay that it, it's kind of shitty, kind of hurts, kind of sucks. Um, but, you know, again, forward progress uh, is, is the goal because every day you're just a little bit better uh, than the last day. You're going to have slip ups and uh, just recognizing, you know, those things that trigger whatever that negative mind that is, what, those things that trigger it. How do you deal with those? Have a plan for it. Um, you know, like I told you, for me, it's, it's ego. I build up in my head that it's, it's all about me, you know, and, and that's kind of, uh, it's easy to slip back into it's when you do something like the Titan games. It's like, oh yeah, I won the Titan games. It's, it's all about me. <laughs> but in reality, it's a, it's a television show and it, it was, you know, it was just part of my life and I had the support of my wife and it took my family to support me. Um, and, and all the guys at the fire station that, you know, cheer me on and stuff like that. Like that's my family. That's like my unit. Right. And I couldn't have done it without any, any of those people. And I try to just kind of remain humble, have some humility and, and do that. But yeah, it's definitely something that, I work on on a regular basis. So uh, outside of that, you know, I um, love anybody to reach out if they have questions about Train for the Wind Thrive. Uh, it's, it's our little side project. Um, I put my heart and soul into that thing. And it's based off of, you know, 13 years of doing CrossFit programming, um, as well as what I've learned where CrossFit has shortcomings. So I wouldn't say it's only a CrossFit program. We do you know, endurance work, we do strength work, and we actually prioritize both of those things as much as what people would call CrossFit conditioning. Um, I make sure that the movements that are uh, high risk, low reward are not a part of our program. So you're not going to be bouncing up and down on a handstand push up. <laughs> Most likely we'll never ever do a muscle up in our program. Um, we won't do pistols. It's just things that I know get people fit. And, uh, and they can benefit from the most without feeling beat up over time. So, yeah, if you want to check it out, check it out. Uh, go to train, trainftw.com. Uh, the program's called Thrive. We'll give you, you know, try it for two weeks. If you hate it, we'll, pay, we'll give you your money back. Love it. Well, hey, you got a new customer. I'm definitely going to have to check it out and support you as well. We'll, we'll, we'll chat yeah. a little bit offline. But aside from that, I know you talked about your training program. Where can people find you just to connect you if they have questions about what we talked about today or just want to get in contact with you? 
Yeah, be best uh, option is uh, I, I check the Instagram Instagram DMs pretty regularly, um, and that's a good place to start. So my Instagram is Matt One Chan, the number one in the center. Um, but yeah, that's probably the best place to start. I, I check them regularly and I respond as quickly as possible. Okay, cool, man. Well, appreciate it, man. You brought a lot of awesome value. Super, super humble guy. Lots of humility, humility talked about today. Lots of value that Try you it. added. No, you're, you're, you're doing more than that, man. You're doing it. You're, you're doing the damn thing. But uh, if y'all made it this far, thank you so much. This again, this is Matt Shane. My name is Jimmy. This is my podcast, Mind Over Matter. Just a guy, just like Matt, who's a firefighter, passionate about serving others, not just when we're on shift, just about changing the world, making the world a better place, living your best life because we only get one shot. Do me a big favor. If you haven't already, press subscribe at the bottom of this video, or if you're listening to this on Apple Podcasts, press subscribe as well for some more awesome content and some other interviews coming your way. So Matt, we'll stick around and chat a couple of minutes offline, but for the rest of y'all, y'all have a great rest of your week this week. Get looking forward to some more awesome stuff headed your way soon. We'll see you. Thanks, Jimmy.